Good morning, everyone. A few more seconds for the photo, please. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for the photo. Thank you so much. You have to go back to your seat. We have to start the press conference. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup pour les photos. If you want to wear the uh, Festival de Cannes mask, you're more than welcome to do so. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're going to be starting the press conference for Flag Day. Uh, I'm going I'm to introduce you to uh, the crew at the other end of the table, the two producers of the film, Fernando Sulicin and William Orberg. Next to them, he composed a very atmospheric and very beautiful music, uh, Joseph Vitarelli. His work as a DP on the film, I think we can all agree on that, is totally amazing. Danny Mortar. <laughs> you can come back here. Uh, the one, uh, the story you saw yesterday uh, belongs to Jennifer Vogel, the writer of the book. the middle of the table. Uh, she's, it's her first time in Cannes. She has a big career, and we know her very well because of Viking Catherine Winnick. <laughs> I guess we can all say that we had a revelation when we saw her on the screen yesterday, Dylan Penn. <laughs> and uh, well, Let's just say that Khan is kind of his home, Monsieur <laughs> Sean Penn. <laughs> Sean, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you uh, by a kind of a very simple and very complicated question at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did you want to put Jennifer's story to the screen? What touched you in the story that you want to tell it? It's always hard to answer questions like that, especially when you, when you, even as you've come up with articulations to, to respond to it or frame it, um, it, it seems to intrude on a, an audience's um, experience with it sometimes when, I think, when a director speaks too much to the origin of their own impulse. I think the simplest thing to say is that, uh, that I thought the writing was uh, fantastic and there were certain images That, that come emotionally to one when they read something. And, and in this case, I, I, and, and sometimes those things can be character driven, but that finding those characters for me starts with an image. And in this case, it was an overlap because the first image I had when I was reading the script the first time was this one's face. <laughs> and, and that maintained. And so with that came all of the rest of it and uh, of course the story itself is compelling it's compelling um, for all the reasons that uh, you know I think are clear and uh, and Jennifer had written such a, a, a beautiful book so that also became a kind of Bible and reference uh, and on we went and Jennifer was there any hesitation when Sean came to you and said uh, I want to put your story to the screen um. Well, when, when a story is so personal as this one is, um, you want to make sure that it's in good hands. Um, so, you know, there's always sort of the tug and pull there as the subject. You know, you, you worry about um, how things will be represented or, um, you know, that the director is going to care for the characters and care really for your family and for you. Um, as a writer, I was very interested in seeing what new art could be made um, from my story, from my memoir. Um, and so it was irresistible, really, um, to go ahead with this. And, and Sean has such a strong affinity for the underdog. Um, and there are many underdogs in my story. So I knew that he would do a good job. And then, of course, when Dylan was cast, um, you know, as it's clear, I'm sure, to all of you, um, these guys have a great relationship, and Dylan. Sean loves Dylan, and so I knew that he would love my character as well. So I felt pretty good about it. Dylan, uh, I wonder what 
reaction, reaction was when your dad asked you to, to play the role. I mean, what he's asking you to do is at the same time very beautiful and very challenging. Is your dad? He's directing you, and this a story about a, a daughter and, he, and, he, and his father. I wonder how you, you, you approach it, and very, very simply, and uh, can you tell us how difficult it was? I mean, at first, I was very apprehensive. I think I said no probably 10 times um, before I said yes. Um, I think, you know, I read this book when I was 15, and then coming back to it at almost 30 was almost like reading, uh, like, my own diary. Um, like, I felt like I had a lot of parallels to the story, and I felt like I could reference my own experiences and bring something to this character, and then especially after meeting Jennifer, and um, I think the most amazing thing that Jennifer gave me was she told me that she didn't want anyone to mimic her. She didn't need me to copy her character, just, um, you know, wanted the story to be told, and I think the script did that in a beautiful way. Um, and, I, yeah, I mean, working with my dad was um, incredible. Catherine, uh the family scenes in the film are incredibly powerful and incredibly strong and very difficult to watch sometimes. Uh, I wonder how, how uh, Sean directed you on that and how he, he, uh, he asked you to, uh, to, to play those scenes and what kind of direction he gave you. Oh, wow. Well, it's <laughs> Sean Penn. <laughs> Such an incredible artist, not even as an as a actor, but as a director, and to get an opportunity to shares the screen with him and just to also see how his eye works and the, the attention to performance, but also visually to be able to capture the story um, on such a level that is really, in my opinion, bringing back the art of filmmaking. And I couldn't be more proud to be part of this family and this journey. A question for you, uh, William and Fernando. Uh, when we watch the movie, there's something very organic to it. It's very natural. It feels very uh, kind of easy. I mean, not easy to, to watch because it's very emotional, but it feels like very organic. Uh, was a production like that or uh, not really? <laughs> <laughs> well, every movie is a challenge to make. It has its own unique set of challenges. And, you know, making independent uh, films with original voices and original stories is uh, certainly not gotten any easier. Uh, but, you know, as a producer, uh, you know, you dream. And my dream in this project from the very beginning was to make the movie with Sean Penn uh, as John Vogel. When I read the manuscript of Jennifer's book, uh, I just thought, wow, that would just be incredible. And then to have a chance to have a real father and daughter play a father and daughter and knowing Sean's commitment to authenticity above anything else uh, and emotional truth. And I thought that would be really a special uh, way for this story to be told. And uh, uh, we didn't compromise. You know, we, we really had to fight hard to get the resources to uh, present Sean's vision. But I had great partners uh, with Fernando and the other producer who's not here today, John Killick. Uh, and we just wanted to have Sean's back to uh, do a very difficult job. He was acting and directing. Fernando? In, in this age of numerics and data, to have such a great director and material and partners to work with, it was a privilege, so we need to support and to go all the way. And it paid off. We're here we're with all of you. It was a fantastic experience, and hopefully we do more. And let's support the artists. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, if you can talk a little bit about the uh, creating this uh, atmospheric sound, this atmospheric music that there is in the in the movie, and also balancing it with all the beautiful songs that uh, uh, Eddie Vedder or uh, other artists have uh, have in the in the movie. Yes. Well, first, uh, those songs that you're referring to were all written for the picture, which is an extraordinary thing. Eddie's work and Glenn Hansford and Kent Power. So my job was to find a way to organically work with those songs, and and the score really is all of us uh, scoring the film together. But it began actually with with Chopin. Sean called and asked um, for two nocturnes uh, to be recorded that he was going to shoot to, and so Chopin was the uh, the first composer on board. 
Then he, what you do in the film, I told you before, is, is amazing. I mean, well, it's really, it really is a beautiful work. Uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, uh, what, Shen, what did he ask you from, for, 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 for the image himself? Well, I think the, one of the first things was just clearly to be on film in that we wanted to um, bring back the memories that we had, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And <clears throat> it just, uh, as a, a forgiving um, you know, format, the, the way the film works. And as you can see, uh, one of the first times I saw it was last night was the transitions between the uh, time periods. You could see kind of these flashes of film. And, I think that's the way our memories work to a degree. Um, little, you know, focus shifts in one way or another, and, and the way film kind of reacted to that. And it was a really refreshing thing, I think, to have to reload the camera on occasion and take a breath. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, we all kind of found our way back to a world that was, you know, just a slower pace and we could have fun, I think. You know, of course, there's sweat and tears in there too, but I, I, I feel like. I was so fortunate. I had the most fun in this job. Um, great crew of people. And um, so, yeah, what Sean had asked me to do was, you know, I was happy to do it every turn. It was a um, collective effort. And um, um, so, yeah, film, film was the first part of that. And uh, shooting on 16, then, I think, was an undeniable, you know, look of, you know, not trying to make it look like digital or anything too flashy. It was just... Um, you know, it was the right it was the right size camera and the right material to to put it into the uh, into the magazines. And it's beautiful. I yeah. think we have a first question. Yes, in the second row. Thank you. My name is Chaz Ebert from uh, Chicago Sun Times and RogerEbert.com. Um, Jennifer alluded to your affinity for the underdog, and I want to take this time while you're on the world stage, to thank you for the extraordinarily kind and compassionate work you did when the whole world was stopped, when we were all afraid, no one really knew that much about the coronavirus pandemic. You put together a group core to do disaster relief. You came to my city, Chicago. You organized testing for poor people all over the city even before the local government did, and you worked with them, the mayor congratulated you. You put together the largest testing system in Los Angeles. And you did this at a time when people were just, it was in chaos. People did not know what to do or where to go. So I just have to thank you for, you also fed people when they came for testing because you went to areas where there were food deserts where people couldn't even get food during the pandemic. Everything was shut down. So I do have to thank you for your extraordinary acts of kindness and empathy and compassion. And I do have a question. My question is, <laughs> whether, is whether your empathy comes from your acting and roles that you've done um, my late husband Roger said that movies are a machine that generates empathy, or whether it's just an inborn instinct. Where does it come from for you? I think probably most of us um, have our fair share of experiences recognizing when we're not accessing our empathy. And so as time goes on and the, and the opportunity that one has creatively in, in, to express, one's usually looking for that they aspire to the most and, and, and often connect with. Um, so what's interesting now, I think, for, for filmmakers uh, and for actors is that we're in a, you know, a time where we're seeing the enormous price that mankind pays uh, for not exercising its empathy to one another and, uh, and, and, and those things in our nature that are not only flawed yesterday and today, but are going to be flawed tomorrow. And so it seems like one of the avenues where one can you know, speak openly and honestly with their heart and, uh, 
you know, maybe live to see another work day, whereas, uh, you know, if you just get out there with your words, you get in trouble. We've got a question right here. Yeah. Uh, Ron Dicker from HuffPost, and this is a question for Dylan. Um, while not to a criminal extent, like your dad's character, was there something that he did to perhaps aggravate you or hurt you that later inspired you? Oh, in reality. In reality. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, <laughs> no. Um, I no. I mean, I feel like I grew up with very supportive, uh, encouraging parents that didn't need to hurt me to inspire me. Um, we have a very different relationship than uh, John, and, John and Jennifer uh, in that way. How about during the filming? <laughs> um, I mean, I think we definitely had some ups and downs. It's also, you know, I went into this project looking at it, I mean, this is a job. I want it to be professional. I, this is my boss, technically, but at the end of the day, he's also my father, and um, we have a complex relationship, and we're both alpha, and I think that can sometimes clash, um, but I think it worked out in the end. <laughs> we got a question over there. Gentleman with a big shot, yeah. Not prepared, sorry. Hi, Matt Donnelly from Variety. Thank God I didn't have to follow Chaz Ebert. That was so lovely. But on the similar topic, um, Sean, I know how much work you've been doing with CORE. Uh, and as a longtime activist, I'm just curious, how do you feel about the rollout of, uh, of the vaccine and testing in the US under Trump? And what is your outlook now? Um, well, I, I don't think that I can illuminate anything that is, sh shouldn't be plain to, you know, to, to the to the eye, uh, we were not only as a country, but as a world um, let down and, and ultimately neglected, uh, misinformed, um, had truth and reason assaulted under what was in all, in all terms an obscene administration, humanly and politically. When, um, when we would, my team and I would come home from uh, test and vaccination sites at night, particularly during the testing period during the Trump administration, the maddening news, you know, it, it really felt like there was someone in a machine gun gunning down communities that were the most vulnerable from a turret at the White House. In the transition, to the task force that President Biden put together, it was really that that feeling like the a, a sun was rising. Now, what what was important was that there was was a pre-buy, and so that was the one the one thing that had happened. But there was no um, um, effort of integrity coming from the federal government until after uh, the Trump administration was dismissed. I think we got a question over there. Yes, hello. Um, you're a journalist from Strasbourg. Um, the movie's about people, but it's also about space. You went to Canada to film to represent the Midwest. Um, what is your idea of filming space? Mm. What image did you want to give of the Midwest, and did you follow any of the descriptions in uh, Jennifer Vogel's book? Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think that from a very young age, when I began to drive across country, you know, across the United States, I, I, I developed a real affinity for the, the landscape of that country. Um, and I'm sure that that's influenced choices that I've made in the movies that I've made um, since then, um, but when with this story, initially in, in part because of the resources, uh, the limitation on resources that we, we would likely have uh, to, to make a story like this today, uh, I very much, and I had said earlier that the key image was Dylan's face as Jennifer. 
And that sort of told me, I listened to that at the time, I said, this is, this is mostly a foreground movie. We're gonna, we, we talked about it early on, that, that that's going to be the key. And when we can open it up, we will. But our focus is going to be on the foreground, on the faces of these actors, of these characters. But of course, when then uh, using um, Winnipeg for, uh, for Minneapolis, because Frankly, it looks more like Minneapolis in the 70s there now than, than Minneapolis does. Uh, you, you know, it offers it, it offered its own uh, spaces. And then there was a lot of times, you know, the, the, Danny and I, would, we might be driving back from a location, see something that was, that opened up our story in a way and come back and shoot there. We, we were, we were um, short on preparation. Uh, this is a movie that got made with a lot of once we once we started shooting, and of course after after shooting, but we had we, our, you know while we all fought to get the the resources we needed to make the movie, part of this was having to kind of have, take a leap of faith with the environment we were in, and and so I I think that you would almost have to ask the environment to get the full answer <laughs> to your question. You got a question over there. Oui, bonjour. C'est une question pour. Je ne peux pas. Je ah, pardon. Excusez-moi. Excusez je peux pas plus. C'est une question pour. Uh, Sean This is a et Dylan. question for Sean and Eddie. Familiale. Dylan, in your own, in your own family, Sean and Dylan, what is the role of education, and what do you think of classical music? The question was about. Sorry, I missed a lot. Of, what is the role of education in my yeah. own family? What, right, and what is the role of uh, classical music? Uh, ah. There wasn't a lot of, of uh, uh, high education in in my in the, my generation of my family. My my, my brothers and I, uh, we had. Um, I can take that off now, I suppose. Uh, I wasn't very. It was not studious myself. And then when my children, Dylan and her brother Hopper. Uh, went to school. It, uh, they they had completely different attacks on it. She was quite studious, um, but uh, I think th there was a big emphasis ultimately. I think with each of us in our ways on on what had become self education. I mean, I started to pay attention to or to my own curiosities uh, after I was out of formal schooling. Um, and, and as for my relationship with the classical music. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a big background in classical music. I have uh, a great a, a appreciation for the beauty of it, but, but interestingly, uh, my childhood best friend uh, has a, a deep relationship with classical music, and he, he ends up being uh, Mr. Vitarelli here, who's the composer, so he was uh, a classical guide. Dylan, you wanted to add something? No? I got a question over there on the other side of the room. Hi, this is Marc Garriga from Catalonia Radio in Barcelona. This is a question for Mr. Penn. Uh, you said that uh, you immediately uh, saw Dylan as Jennifer when you read the book. Uh, when did you see yourself as John? And I know that uh, Dylan has just said no, but did you, see, did you saw any similarity between uh, Jennifer and her father's relationship and you and your daughters? Okay. I'll start at the end of that question because I think you can all, you're going to find similarities, uh, you know, that are not in any way direct connections. Uh, but yes, I mean, emotionally, certainly, you find similarities, misunderstandings, miscommunications, all those things that you know that that are inevitable in, in any intimate familial relationship. As far as myself, seeing myself playing the role, that was not on, in the cards initially. I, I, in, in part because I had adopted a sort of religion of, of clarity that I never wanted to uh, do a second job when I had a first job of directing. Uh, and, 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 and to act and direct was not appealing to me. In this case, uh, over time, as uh, with a lot of nudging from producers who thought it might be a, a worth considering uh, for me to consider doing it. Um, and there became a point of necessity to make a decision who was going to play this part. And I remember that the last uh, effort I made to, to, 
to not play it was uh, when I sent the script about a month and a half before shooting started to Matt Damon, who was generous enough to give it a very quick read and call me, not to say that he can do it, not to say that he can't do it, but to say that I was a stupid schmuck not to do it, to take this opportunity to act with my daughter in this thing. So that was kind of the last straw. And then, you know, once, once, once I decided to do that, I did, I, there was a big burden off me because whenever you're directing actors, there's a certain emotional politic you're dealing with. You know, even if it's in how many takes you do on one person and then you turn around to come on the other and maybe you're just, satisfied over here and not over, but you kind of have to make everybody feel equally cared for. I didn't have to waste time with one of the principals in the piece, and that was the case, you know, with the other actors as well. It was just easy to sort of say to myself, okay, I got what I need of my stuff. Let's focus it here now. And that's taking one complicated personality out of the mix, which is, you know, not bad, not a bad option. Yes, we got a question over there. Hello, I'm Galia from Chile. I wanted to ask you about one of the top, one of, sorry, one of the topics of the film that is truth, is talking tr truth between a daughter and the father, father, daughter, and also what became this uh, leitmotiv that turns her into a journalist to tell the truth. So how did you depict this topic in the film? Yeah. Um. It, 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 I, it, how did I think just the way that it happens in life, you know, that there's, there's the, the, the key thing in this film for me about deception and about a, a, a search for truthfulness, which is, could be a black and white description of two of the characters, is that I had, again, this goes back to Dylan's face, when, because she is an actress, I find her completely uncontrived, which is, Lack of contrivance is about as beautiful a thing to put in front of a camera as there is. And just as specifically, watching somebody listen, whether they're buying what they're hearing, they're not, or they're confused at it, when you have a, an, an actor, as it turns out she is, where you can put the camera on her listening, and that tells you the whole world of truth and deception uh, in, in her reactions to, you know, in particular the relationship with her father, to the things he does and says. So I think what, I, what, it, what the film ends up relying on, certainly there was that which was provided by the story itself, the screenplay itself, but I think my cinematic reliance was on Dylan's face to tell that story. Lady in the second row, please. Hello, my name is Sara Ricordati. I'm from Italy, magazine Gente. The question is for Sean Penn. Um, uh, the, the movie shows very much exactly how much you love your daughter by all these close-ups on her face. And I was also wondering um, if it also tells a bit about maybe you being an absent father or not because of your career, maybe? <laughs> this would be the assumption but what I would have you do is go on to IMDb and check the months of the jobs I took during her childhood. This is uh, this is this has been a conversation we've had in, in the past. I was uh, what, one of the great things about the privilege that that, that I've had in, in working in film and being a, a parent is that while there are periods of time where one's away, and we would always make sure that, you know, if I wasn't flying home on a Friday night and back on a Sunday night to get back to work, that the, that the kids were coming to visit, uh, you know, without more than two weeks going by on any job and so on. But once you get done with that job, you're the only parent in town that's there 24-7. That's where the kids get upset, <laughs> is when you're there all the time. But look, you, you strike a balance. We we do the work we do. There were, there were times that I was away too long. There was a, you know, I don't know that there's such thing as a parent that feels complete in any of that. Uh, but seems like they still like me okay, so <laughs> work with it. So, so yeah, yeah, of course, I mean, it, it's just there's nothing you could mention in detail on the 
parent-child connection that isn't in some way, you know, familiar to anybody who's a parent. Dylan, can we have the kids' point of view on this answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel like my parents were extremely present throughout my childhood. I think also um, the fact that they took us out of Los Angeles where um, the industry is kind of the focal point um, was an amazing decision and I think just uh, leading us to a normal uh, upbringing. Okay, we have time for one more question. Lady over there. Hi. Hello, my name is Alejandra Musi from Mexico. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Penn. Uh, I read that in the beginning of the project, you involved Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu. He was a little bit working with you. Uh, could you tell us about that collaboration and why he didn't continue in the project? And of course, if, if you will consider it to work with him again in the future. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. This was uh, Bill Horberg and I were, were you know, this is it, it, early on. The, the 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 offer to me was, do you want to direct this? Do you want to act in this? Do you want to do both? That was how the project was presented to me. And I didn't want to, as I had said earlier, I didn't want to do both. Um, and then, so we talked about a couple of different um, possibilities, and you know, I think of Alejandro as 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 good a filmmaker as we have in the world today and so of course the answer is if i want to work with anybody you know put him on top of that list but uh so he um they, it wasn't even certain by that time if i was going to do it as i remember that went through but but it was to see if he wanted to look at directing it and he did spend some time with jez butterworth but i don't actually know the resolution of how that what happened but he got invested i think in um birdman, birdman. and yeah and 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 went off and so it just drifted yeah uh-huh jennifer dylan shun catherine danny joseph william fernando merci beaucoup thank you very much thank you.